I'm Tamina Kazji, an independent broadcast journalist, and this is The Point, my personal talk show on the most pressing issues in the news cycle. Join me as I speak to a wide range of panelists and experts in the subject matter on basically systemic issues and always looking for actionable solutions. Well, on today's episode, my focus is on domestic violence, which is the shadow pandemic during global COVID-19 lockdowns. Now, of course, intimate partner abuse and domestic violence is an ongoing global pandemic, which only worsens during times of crises. WHO, um, the UN Women, all manner of international as well as localized organizations have also warned in the days before COVID-19 lockdowns came into play and currently as they're ongoing, that male violence against women and girls always sees an uptick during such times of crisis. Now, for example, in Hubei province in China, did you know that during their ongoing lockdown, which extended past 11 or 12 weeks, reports of domestic violence ranging all the way from physical, psychological, sexual, or economic mistreatment of a family member increased by nearly 50%. That's just China's one province, Hubei province. What about the shadow pandemic of domestic violence in Southeast Asia? Well, that is exactly the point of today's show. And on that note, joining me are four exceptional panelists to discuss this urgent topic. Let's bring them in now, one by one. I have joining me Shazana Aga who is Head of Research with Women's Aid Organization, Malaysia. Hey, Shazana. Hi. Hi, Tamina. I also have Sharina Sharif, who is the Program Manager for Advocacy, Legal Services and Research with Sisters in Islam in Malaysia. Hi, Sharina. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Tamina. We also have Filza Sumartono. Projects Manager for AWARE, which is the Association of Women for Action and Research in Singapore. Hey, Filza. Hi. Hi, Temina. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, Filza. And Anindya Restuviani. Anindya is the co-director with Hollaback Jakarta, as well as the co-coordinator with Jakarta Feminist Association, both based in Indonesia. Hi, Anindya. Hi, 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 Tamina. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Okay, brilliant to have all of you here today. How's everybody doing under lockdown and varying levels of working on the outside and also working from home? <laughs> yes, yeah. doing well, inshallah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Very challenging. Challenging indeed. Doing well, but it, but it's been very challenging. Yeah, surviving, yes. surviving yeah. the lockdown. <laughs> Right, so let's get cracking, um, ladies. Now, of course, um, I want to actually backtrack a little rather than just getting the conversation started off with domestic violence itself. Let's backtrack and set the scene for why domestic violence is so prevalent in the first place. So this is a generalized question. Um, I would like to start off with what do you feel socializes men into believing they own women's bodies and are entitled to abuse female bodies? So whichever one of you would like to respond, um, just give me a physical signal and I'll look out for that and I'll call out your name and please go ahead. <laughs> I think, well, I think, okay, let me start. Um, sure, sure. Uh, no, nobody yeah. is, right? Okay, I'm gonna raise my hand. <laughs> okay, we'll go with Sharina first and then get to Anindya. Uh, well, I think it's the, you know, systemic patriarchy that exists in, you know, many countries globally. Um, and it impacts on um, women's empowerment um, in many ways, uh, you know, in terms of their self-determination as well as in terms of their uh, economic conditions, um, you know, women uh, are less educated uh, in employment. They are mainly uh, um, more involved in the 
informal sector, the low paying uh, jobs, um, health issues as well, uh, don't receive the adequate um, attention uh, when it comes to, to women. So several uh, uh, areas. And I think uh, one of the areas that we are looking at especially is in the, in the role of religion um, and with it also cultural and social norms that come uh, uh, with the influence of religion. And that, that is the area for Sisters in Islam because in Malaysia also uh, we have uh, laws which are Sharia laws, uh, religion-based laws. Um, so, um, uh, you know, in that regard, it has become uh, a public policy uh, and, and uh, exists within the public sphere. And so this kind of discrimination is, is very difficult to tackle because they believe that it is, uh, you know, based on, on uh, God's law. Um, and so the, the norms that discriminate and uh, that cause um, uh, uh, disempowerment of women, it's very difficult to tackle. I'll give you an example. Um, sure. for, for example, when we, uh, many years ago, when uh, uh, we were introducing the Domestic Violence Act, one of the major uh, detractors was the Muslim conservative lob lobby. Uh, and uh, the, the reasoning given behind that was that in Islam, um, uh, men are allowed to beat their wives. Men are allowed to discipline their wives uh, mm -hmm. according to the Quran. Uh, uh, and so it was a whole uh, uh, mobilization that we had to do in Malaysia uh, to show uh, textual in interpretations which uh, refute this, which reject this idea. Um, and so fortunately for us, uh, we, we worked together with the non-Muslim community and we managed to get the Domestic Violence Act through. Um, the, the, the thinking on domestic violence today, uh, both in Islam and in all uh, religions, I think has changed drastically. Of course, there are uh, people who still believe in very traditional values where men can beat women and that's why we are seeing uh, a lot of domestic violence still but at least um, there is also one uh, you know one sector that that is uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, um, uh, to stop the violence against women so those are the kind and then i think there are other influences as well television social media so on and so forth but you know these are all things that we are already aware of as well that's right. Thanks for that, Sharina. I love that you also contextualize it with the fact that Sisters in Islam always looks at a faith-based approach of refuting the stereotypes and patriarchal attitudes. Uh, from yeah. there, Anindya, you said you wanted to make some points about the same question, speaking about what do you feel socializes men in your context in Indonesia to believe that they own women's bodies and that they can abuse women's bodies mm -hmm. i felt like this kind of issue is definitely not just happened in indonesia or or in southeast asia in particular but uh, i agree with uh, the previous statement saying about this is about patriarchal culture this is about the systemic you know discrimination that basically being taught uh, in our society for a very long time, uh, it's definitely contribution from religion and also the 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 cultural the that has been you know growing in our uh, social society for a very long time as well. But I think like um, to basically kind of like uh, adding to what uh, what the statement before uh, mentioning about all the systemic also patriarchal culture, I think. It, so the way that uh, you know, so like a lot of normalization uh, that keeps that basically keeps nurturing this kind of behavior. Um, in Hollaback Jakarta itself, we are beginning. We are focusing on um, harassment that happened. Um, that most of the time being very normalized, like a street, uh, like a street harassment or a harassment in public space. That a lot of it's a joke. It's it's something that people think that is funny, but apparently 
um, if we took like a, if we look at this kind of issue a deeper, it's basically like the beginning everything that kind of like you know compiled into something bigger and bigger and bigger. The more people normalize, you know, like a little or petty behavior, and that's how men think that it's okay to kind of like escalate to other. Um, issue and because of this normalization, this normalization that actually for me it actually came from a very specific and stereotyping uh, gender role that it came to women and also create this normalization. And at the end, when there's like a lot of stereotypes, there's a lot of comes to a lot of victim blaming itself at the end of the day when we when we are basically uh, facing a woman being abused and stuff like that. So, yeah, I just wanted to add on. Yeah, absolutely. Because what, what starts out on the streets, um, you can only imagine how it escalates, whereby uh, entire populations in all our cities are currently under lockdown and everything becomes confined within the four walls of a home. Um, Filza, did you have anything to contribute to that from a Singaporean perspective? What do you feel actually... Um, involves um, the socializing of men in Singaporean society that also makes uh, it prevalent in Singapore? I think it's similar with Malaysia and Indonesia as well, that there is a culture of normalization, there mm. is um, sexual objectification of women as well in Singapore, and also that um, perpetrators can get away with it quite easily, and they are still in positions of power and influence, they still have community support and respect, that's why domestic violence is still prevalent at this day and age. That's right. And uh, moving into um, Shazana. Shazana, what are other um, damaging South Asian and Southeast Asian, uh, be they religious or even cultural norms, that mm -hmm. uh, WAO has also noticed uh, impact gender equality and domestic violence? Yeah, so um, I think, to be clear, I think um, uh, gender patri patriarchal cultural norms are uh, a situation across the world. And mm -hmm. for, but for Southeast Asia and for Malaysia specifically, I think the perpetuation of certain ideas like um, having to police women's dressing, uh, who are women who are entering into government buildings, um, you know, discourses in public media around how, uh, guidelines that should be imposed, um, portrayal, sexist portrayal of women in the media, um, and uh, victim blaming uh, discourses around uh, uh, for of victims. These are all uh, uh, these are all things that contribute to the perpetuation of you know violence. That's right. Right. So these are all things that we are not only exposed to, but possibly even more um, targeted during times of a lockdown where people are within four closed doors, uh, four walls. Now, uh, moving on into the topic of domestic violence proper. Um, I have an example from the UK. Um, UK's largest domestic abuse charity, Refuge, they actually reported a 700% increase in calls to their helplines in a single day. Um, I wanted to ask um, each of you, organizationally, what have your hotlines been dealing with in this time? But I um, think... Go ahead, Sorry, Shazana. Yeah. No, I think go uh, ahead, Shazana, because okay. I think WAO has, yeah, most of okay, the... Sure. So um, actually, WAO um, provides two kinds of hotline services. One is via call and the other is via WhatsApp. And so um, what we've noticed is that uh, when we compared our statistics from February to March, we saw a 44% increase. And now that we're coming into April, we are actually seeing in the first two weeks of uh, April, 162 0.4% increase compared to the first two weeks of March. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, compared to the first two weeks of February. So we're seeing 162% increase. That is beyond alarming. Um, Sharina, what did you have to add just now about uh, con at the same time, how, what kind of response has the Telenisa web uh, hotline been receiving? Yeah. Telenisa hotline deals mainly with uh, Sharia issues, uh, Sharia laws, 
So the issues that our client face are the uncertainties of what's happening uh, for them within the court process. So some people are worried that their protection order will not continue, for example, during this, this period. Um, and so what happens, uh, how do they renew it, uh, whether it still remains enforceable. Um, some people are concerned because, um, you know, their, their divorce proceedings are not going through and, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Um, other issues that keep uh, uh, rising are, for example, uh, maintenance, because obviously, um, you know, everybody is uh, facing financial constraints. And what we're finding is that a lot of women uh, don't necessarily have even bank accounts, uh, you know, so online transfers might be difficult for some for some women. So in, even in order to receive money, it's difficult for them. Um, so, you know, I mean, these are all situations that we never thought about. So because physical delivery of cash is no longer possible and therefore it's it's an issue of survival for a lot of these women uh, as well. So it's, it's more these kind of issues but um, obviously I think um, domestic violence is even more um, I think serious, intense in this in this uh, uh, situation and um, actually the, the, in the first week or so we didn't receive so many calls and we were very, very alarmed about that because we were worried that women could not reach out, could not get the help that they want. And I think even though the statistics have risen very drastically uh, in April, I think there are still many women uh, trapped in their, in their situation of not being able to seek help when they need it. That's right. Um, Anindya, I wanted to ask you, um, what's the scenario with um, Hollaback Jakarta that's currently now coordinating mm -hmm. with Jakarta Feminist Collective also to reach women on the ground? Um, your lockdown has not been going on for as long as in Malaysia or Singapore circuit breaker. What's the scenario? What do marginalized and at-risk women need most mm -hmm. at this point in time? So to begin with, actually, like the rate of domestic violence in Indonesia is already pretty high. So in 2019 itself, we, I mean, a nationwide, we received uh, 430,000 reported cases only in a year, and 80% of it actually occurred in private settings. So the lockdown or the safe breaker, whatever the, the correct term is, uh, in Jakarta itself, it started... It started like around a month ago, even though the government just only announced it as like a mandatory uh, thing for the past two weeks. But uh, for the past one, sorry, from 16, 16 March until 1st April, we partner with um, APIC Legal Aid, which is a legal aid that focuses on violence against women and also women who facing legal issue. We receive around uh, 56 cases uh, uh, reported, which is like it's around a, a week of, um, of the lockdown itself. So saying those numbers is actually, we, we're looking at the scenario where it actually increased three times higher than the regular uh, reporting cases that came in to us and also um, the legal aid itself. So it's, that's based on that issue itself, we are also looking at the pattern because like usually this uh, victim of domestic violence, like when they need to flee their house, we usually refer it to uh, some, uh, uh, basically like a, a woman and children department in in each region uh, that basically kind of like providing them with safe house because we don't have safe, safe house and Afrika Legal Aid also doesn't have safe house. So we're referring to the basically the government safe house. But due to the pandemic itself, the safe house are closed. So all of the people who are already inside of this safe house are forced to basically get out of the safe house. So we basically kind of need more safe space for like all of this women who are already in the situation and people who are starting to uh, basically reporting to us about the situation they are uh, having in their house. Um, so yeah. That's right. Uh, I wanted to move into um, Filza. Filza, now in um, Singapore, what is the scenario regarding particularly shelters for uh, domestic violence and women who have suffered this during the COVID-19 lockdown. Are the shelters still open? Are they, um, have they reached full capacity? What's happening right now? 
Um, so the shelters are still open. We haven't reached full capacity yet for crisis shelters, but we are definitely recommending that, you know, we be prepared for an onslaught of um, applications for crisis shelters because in Singapore, our homeless shelters are already at full capacity and they are scrambling to build temporary accommodations for homeless shelters. So we are saying that we really have to expect the same for crisis shelters for victims of domestic violence as well. Right. And uh, Shazana, could you give us a picture of uh, WAO's um, shelter? Um, has it reached full capacity? Are you struggling to find uh, more placements for women trying to escape domestic violence currently? Yes. So actually, um, WA shelter has reached maximum capacity. And um, currently, as we are answering our calls, uh, people, we have survivors who are calling for who are in distress are looking for spaces, shelters, yeah. And we are not able to refer them to the government shelters because they are closed. Um, we are also not able to refer them to other shelters which are currently have, uh, operating at either limited capacity or are closed altogether. So we, we, we really need uh, to have temporary shelters. And this is one of the things that we are proposing to the government. We, we're really asking the government to make shelters an essential service, um, given the fact that- As they that, should be. As they as should they be. Should. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, given the fact that domestic violence that globally, you know, we, we can see that domestic violence is an issue that has, uh, that it, it, they, they call it a pandemic within a pandemic. Uh, so, so and, and, and it needs to be addressed alongside the COVID-19 response. So shelters, uh, WAO's call is to make shelters an essential service. That's right. Okay, so from there, I want to um, go into a little bit behind how, what goes on, not only in the media, but from official channels of information like the government, um, can be either helpful or it can be damaging. Uh, in a best case kind of scenario, you have, for example, France's Gender Equality Ministry, which announced at the beginning of their COVID-19 lockdown, just one day before Malaysia started which is um, 32 days ago, they announced that they will prepare and pay for 20,000 hotel nights for domestic violence abuse survivors. So that's on one end of the extreme of, you know, absolutely best practices. Uh, on the other hand, I wanted to discuss a little bit about um, worst practice scenarios. Um, uh, to do with COVID-19 and sexism. Uh, and this I would like to refer to um, all of you, but in particular to Sharina and Shazana, because um, our Ministry of Women in Malaysia, of course, was widely criticized um, with recommendations for a putting on a Doraemon voice, for example, to maintain the peace in the house. Now, jokes aside, all the memes that have gone around on social media, why is something an issue such as this so very damaging when it is treated as such by a ministry that ought to be responsible for not just reducing but addressing domestic violence um Sher sharina ah, well i think you know um again we've reached uh, global recognition for the wrong reasons um yeah, this, this, firstly, it stereotypes women into a particular, you know, into a particular box, into a particular function. Um, secondly, it's a sense of uh, victim blaming because, you know, uh, you know, it's up to you to behave in the right way. Otherwise, uh, you know, you might see certain unwanted behaviours by your husband. So I think the message that needs to go out is that there is no uh, tolerance for violence, not at all. And that uh, women have the right to, to seek help um, and that women uh, do, not, um, do not in any circumstance have to uh, or deserve violence, you know, in this situation. Um, so I think that... So strong message has not been communicated uh, by our minister or, or, or uh, anyone at all uh, within the government, and it's it's critical to get the 
you know the message across uh, the, uh, the 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 issue of domestic violence it very much rests upon um community and public support uh you know as a victim of domestic violence if you're not convinced that uh people will support you or if you're not convinced that there there is available support ready available support then it makes it more difficult for them to come out uh of their situation you know because obviously the the repercussions are very high so uh, yeah it it was very damaging the women's groups came out uh, very strongly against it uh we did receive an apology from the minister for you know the doremon um reference uh but again we haven't received a, a very strong message in terms of you know the police are there to help you the social services are working and you know just following on from shivana statement the shelters are open and operational um i think that is the kind of information that needs to go out very very quickly absolutely it's not just about apologizing when something yeah. happens which is um absolutely unfortunate but it's also about assuring not just women yeah. out there but also as a warning to those who abuse look right. we've got yeah. the back of our women you know yeah. i mean i think that's yeah. so important uh filza yeah. i wanted to ask you um are there any uh worst case or best case scenarios that you have encountered with the work that aware has been doing during the covid-19 um circuit breakers in singapore Um, so so far, the government have set up a national care hotline to offer emotional support for anyone facing domestic violence and all that. But we are also very disappointed that in Singapore, psychological treatment is not considered an essential service unless it's like you know someone is at danger of harming themselves. But I mean, mental health mental health advocates are saying that you know it's really too late if someone has become unstable to then go out, go out to reach for help. and also they say that mental health services can be done remotely but a lot of um psychologists are saying that a lot of their clients may not have suitable environments to have um telecounseling sessions or teleconferencing sessions especially if they have family violence occurring in the place where they are staying so um not having psychological treatment as an essential service is yeah is a great disappointment to us as well understood um shazana your perspectives on any of the best case scenarios that we have in malaysia perhaps yeah i think um in terms of best case scenarios i think people are beginning to realize that um with 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 the current situation that we're facing everybody needs to come together pull resources and respond together you know government and ngos and and speaking about government and ngo collaboration uh we have for instance uh i can speak for my organization where wao is now supporting the national covid-19 psychosocial support hotline uh which mm-hmm. has been set up by the ministry of health and mercy malaysia so when and this line has been publicized by uh, the majlis keselamatan negara for instance you know so the national security uh, council so so when survivors call into this line they have the option of uh, speak, uh, speaking to a wao crisis support officer about uh, abuse and, and this is great mm. because, because survivors then are able to access uh, specialized services that are needed for survivors of violence right so this is, yeah so this is sorry this so this is just one instance of an ngo and uh government collaboration another another really uh important thing is that the selangor state government has also called has also mobilized ngos to uh and and together they have formed a selangor task force uh where uh, they are identifying arising needs from communities during this time and together trying to respond to them so in uh, issues like uh, child malnutrition uh, domestic violence mental health issues together 
uh, the Selangor Task Force is trying to address this locally. So this is another example of you know NGO and uh, government co collaboration that is th that is very potent uh, possible. But um, moving forward, I think what we really need is a systematic coordination at the national level, and for this we need the national committee on handling domestic violence which has been set up by the ministry of women last year we need this committee to come into action and to coordinate all the efforts to ensure that the response to domestic violence during this time is effective that's right so a national approach definitely now um for our viewers out there if you're just joining us uh, welcome to The Point. I'm Tamina Kauzji, your host. I'm an independent broadcast journalist. This talk show focuses on the most current issues in the news cycle. Today, we're talking about domestic violence, the shadow pandemic during COVID-19 lockdowns with a panel of four from regionally uh, representing Malaysia, as well as Singapore and Indonesia. Sisters in Islam and um, Women's Aid Organization from Malaysia joined by um, Hollaback Jakarta and um, Jakarta Feminist Net, uh, Network, as well as AWARE from Singapore. Um, Anindya, I wanted to go yeah. back to you because speaking about a national approach, now Indonesia, of course, um, Jakarta itself has a population of almost 10 million. Um, what do you know about some of the ongoing efforts between uh, feminist organizations to ensure that women outside of Jakarta their needs are also being addressed during this very critical time when domestic violence is on the uptick. Well, currently with my organization itself, we try our best to kind of um, helping people that is uh, helping women that is around our area first, because there are so many um, uh, women that are basically very affected to this pandemic itself. So our help right now focusing on a victim of domestic violence and the uh, women as the head of the family and also women who basically uh, affected in terms of they are a single parent or those who are basically lost their job. So these are our focus right now. So at some level, like every day, all the people who are seeking for help, it, it keeps increasing to the point that we are also receiving reports from this labor worker who's basically being laid off. Uh, there's like an, around 800 female uh, labor workers during the pandemic that doesn't need any kind of support either from the company that they were working from or uh, the government itself. So in, uh, the, right now, the national government itself, I felt like in dealing with the COVID-19 itself, we are basically a very uh, behind comparing to other um, uh, countries in the world. So a lot of a lot of don't don't playing from the government itself. There's also, um, uh, also like, uh, there's not, a regulation that right. came in from that came from the, I'm, I'm, I think I'm back right now right yes you're back yeah, right so I think like there's a lot of uh, yeah so the way that the government was basically dealing with the pandemic itself is basically we are way behind uh, comparing to other countries in the world so uh, I felt like a lot of time the government still downplaying the virus itself so that's why we do not have a very good systemic way in order for us to deal with the pandemic and moreover dealing with the pandemic shadow itself is on the issue of domestic violence so in uh, in Indonesia before the pandemic itself, we, uh, we have been um, advocating on the anti-sexual violence bill that's still in the process of legalization in the House of Representatives right now. So currently, in terms of we are dealing with the domestic violence nationwide, we do not have enough or adequate law to basically able to persecute uh, the uh, the perpetrators or to protect the victim itself. So outside of Jakarta right now, we are working with we call it forum pengada layanan or the service provider. Uh, basically, this is a network of a lot of legal aid, a lot of com uh, community, and also like a, a CSO that focuses on the issue of violence against women. So we are working with them to ensure that um, all there are people outside of Jakarta that probably need help that we cannot uh, be there. At, we cannot we cannot immediately help them because like even in Jakarta and around Greater Jakarta itself, the number is very overwhelming. 
So that's why we are uh, we are uh, focusing uh, more on a building networks and also how to basically mm. kind of like uh, helping this uh, other CSOs that working on the uh, on the uh, on the issue of women itself to be able to kind of help people who are oh, especially women who are in need outside of Jakarta. So, yeah. That's right. Thanks, Anindya. From there, I'd like to move to uh, Filza. Filza, now speaking about um, working from home, which is also um, a social reality for many of us right now, but how can working from home scenarios also increase um, or worsen domestic violence during COVID-19 lockdowns? Has AWARE been in touch with or worked with any cases where it was actually work from home scenarios that led to an uptick in domestic violence in Singapore? Um, yes, definitely work from home does contribute to an uptick in um, domestic violence, especially mm. because in Singapore, for some of our so schools are now um, remote learning as well. We have home-based learning. So um, in Singapore, we have this issue of overcrowding. Yes, there is an issue of overcrowding in migrant dormitories, but we also have it in the community as well, where we have small rental apartments and apartments in Singapore are not big. As you know, it's only getting smaller. So our public rental apartments are tiny and some families are made to share their rental flats with other families or like single persons are made to share with other single persons. So there have been cases of where housemates, because they're not going out to work, um, they are becoming abusive towards each other since everyone is just stuck in small cramped conditions. In some low-income families, we have 7, 12 family members staying under one roof. So you have like adults, teenagers, children, babies stuck in a tiny rental apartment for the whole day. So conflicts are bound to happen. Um, for schools as well, because some of them are using um, Zoom as a platform, um, recently there was an incident even where during a secondary school geography geography lesson on zoom it was hijacked by two hackers and students were shown pornographic images by the hackers so we are also expecting more of image-based sexual assault happening due to um, home-based learning and work from home mm -hmm. right so all of these are you know hugely concerning issues because it just goes to show that at all intersections of society uh, women and girls females are subject to a lot more um, domestic violence during the lockdown period uh, from there I wanted to move into the scenario of of course uh, women are overall poorer than men making less money regardless of whether you're working in the corporate sector but particularly for underprivileged women those who work in uh, low paid uh, food production work, for example, agriculture, grocery stores, daily roadside stalls, they have basically lost their entire source of income during um, COVID-19 lockdowns. I uh, wanted to ask uh, Sharina or Shazana, how does it also further impact women when their source of daily income making actually gets cut off? How does that increase the incidence of domestic violence occurring now that they have no choice but to stay home? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think the issue of uh, um, income relates to empowerment and then, you know, I mean, violence is both cause and consequence in that sense. Um, you know, because I think um, for a lot of women, we started discussing this issue when we were talking about the uh, gender equality um, legislation that, that that was proposed. Mm. Um, and, and it became very apparent that women were, um, majority of uh, women were in the informal sector and they didn't receive the, you know, the social security net uh, that, uh, um, uh, fully employ full employment uh, offers, um, and, and th that this was a problem because then uh, it leads to other issues. But yeah, I mean the issue of financial stress um, is one of the reasons uh, for domestic violence, um, and especially if you have the women being um, the breadwinner. Uh, actually, some of our star stories are quite sad. Where even though the husband is the you know is working and earning, the money doesn't necessarily get spent on uh, the household. 
um, you know, the children don't get properly fed. Um, so the women still have to reach out and, and you know, uh, make their own earning so that in, in order to feed themselves and their children. That's right. Um, Shazana, do you have anything to... Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think I just want to echo the fact that financial, the lack of financial uh, access to financial resources is definitely a reason why violence could escalate. Um, and this, uh, and it it further disempowers the survivor because um, it, you can see it as a loss of the survivor's control when she doesn't a power and control when she does not have um, enough money. She has to depend on. Um, the perpetrator, you know, so uh, the law and and the, we can see that a lot of women are in uh, vulnerable empl employment in the informal sector, uh, in uh, having um, contract jobs in such and uh, and, and jobs like this. So so we we see that a lot. Uh, actually, um, about twenty five percent of women and twenty percent of men are in vulnerable employment. So we see that women are more uh, vulnerable when uh when it comes to uh the, the economic impacts of this uh covid yeah so but uh we want to emphasize here even uh access to aid such as the bantuan prihati negara for instance how right. yeah so how does that affect uh domestic violence survivors who are not classified as single or and and not divorced you know, they are in the middle. So they are undergoing processes of divorce and they are categorized as married. Yeah, so we have cases where uh, there is competition between the survivor and the perpetrator. So uh, a, a woman of five kids uh, who, who has separated from her husband uh, but uh, is unable to apply for this aid because um, her husband has already applied for it, you know. Uh, and then uh, in a, another instance where a perpetrator got so angry that he uh, this, he started abusing the survivor because she had gotten the aid first. You see, so the, these are sources of uh, tension for uh, survivors, and um, and this, this is one thing that we've called on the government to address. Yeah, I think Tamina, if I can just add, um, yeah, sure. the government has come up with some. Uh, proposals for the for the B40 for the underprivileged but I think there isn't um, you know there isn't enough data to support um, uh, a, a more targeted um, economic uh, um, assistance towards women so I think generally it's not just about, about uh, uh, victims of violence but generally women and children will be the most affected in any sort of crisis and this is you know nationwide global globally um, uh, impacting women and children and I think we don't have uh, we haven't seen the capacity to deal uh, with targeted issues uh, related to gender inequality and how then to deal with economic uh, support for that for that purpose. Understood. Yes, I'd just like to also reiterate for everybody uh, watching us that we are addressing domestic violence during COVID-19 lockdowns with my panel today on The Point. And let's remember domestic violence encompasses physical, sexual, psychological and economic violence towards members of households. Disproportionately, the survivors, the victims are women. Uh, Anindya, I wanted to move back mm -hmm. to you on this point. Uh, your organizations have been doing a lot of work um, on the ground at the grassroots with street feeding. I wanted to ask, is there um, a disparity or are women and girls disproportionately um, represented in those who need immediate um, necessities on a daily basis, such as food and water, drinks and other um, sanitary items? I think like when we're talking about households in a traditional way, I felt like a lot of this domestic, you know, burden came to women. So in a lot of sense, there are like the reports on, oh, we don't have water, we don't have food, actually came from women because they are the ones who are kind of like dealing with this domestic issue at home. So at some level, the pandemic itself is bring more burden to women because they are the one who needs to think about the domestic needs available in the house. So that that's why like more reports coming in and stuff like that but we are but one of the reasons why we are focusing mostly on 
uh, basically women as the head of the family and also the single parents who basically lost their job. Mm. It's basically because like we have, I think in Southeast Asia, we know this a right hailing application that is basically very popular in our region in, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. We have uh, Grab and also we have Gojek. Our, and in Indonesia, the service itself is not limited to right hailing uh, uh, services, but also we have like a massage services, we have cleaner services and stuff like that. So during the pandemic, the the massage services, the uh, cleaner services are all of them are shut down because like those services are very personal and very private. They basically go to the house and stuff like that. So in order to basically cutting the virus spreading, so they have to cut off the services itself. So unfortunately, the most I think, if I'm not mistaken, eighty percent of the partners that are, the people who are providing services through that app through those apps are actually women. So in a sense, there are a lot of women who are losing their main income um, because of the, you know, like the cutting of the services itself. And it, in terms of the, the right hailing transportation uh, itself, uh, we see a lot of women who are a driver of a motorcycle driver or like the car driver are actually the one who are uh, more impacted comparing to them, uh, uh, the, the male drivers. Because uh, when we were talking to this uh, woman who are also doing, uh, who are working in this uh, uh uh, who are working as a female driver, uh, they mentioned that like, oh, when it comes to us, then we also have our children to be taken care of. So we cannot go out and, um, you know, actually with men, like they can still go out because for example, they have their wife to, uh, taking care of the uh, children and stuff like that. So they can go out and actually receiving help from people who are basically doing a uh, quote unquote street feeding. Uh, so it's easier for men to basically access the help that is available in a public space but when it comes to women who are basically forced to be stay at home and unable to basically go out and do uh, the work that they were doing that we basically need we are the ones who's trying to reach out to them and saying like oh uh, uh, uh we have we, we we provide help for you and stuff like that so uh but and I, adding to uh, things that we have already discussed about about how the national the government itself how they are providing um um, help to people who are mostly affected. Um, I think it's very unfortunate in Indonesia right now that uh, that the government is very focusing only on the uh, basically the uh, social like the enterprises, the uh, small and medium enterprises. That I know that it's a lot of are a very affected, uh, very affecting women as well. But they are not really talking about like this women who are basically not part of that business. So, um, and they basically also released this thing called Kartu Prasukerja. Basically, I initially thought this will be a more on a very immediate response in terms of a financial thing to help people who are not working. So, Prasukerja means like those people who are not employed yet. So, but when we are trying to log into the system, apparently they're just providing subsidized training that will help them to get jobs which is very unfortunate because like these people right now, they don't need training. They need like immediate response to their financial crisis in terms of uh, situation during the coronavirus itself. And one of the things that make it worse for a victim of sexual, uh, sorry, domestic violence to flee from house that we basically are receiving a lot of cases right now, a lot of the perpetrators are right now threatening the victim. If you are fleeing the house, especially with your children, that I'm going to report you to the police because you are endangering our children to be exposed to the virus. So that's why it's hard for them to actually go out of the house carrying their children. And stuff like that. So it's basically giving them more pressure to uh, basically unable to uh, flee in from that situation as well. And exactly. one more thing, I yeah, one more thing, I just want yeah. to add. Uh, those are the cases that happen in Singapore, uh, the Zoom call and stuff like that. We are also receiving a higher number of reports on digital violence, not only on Zoom, but also like people reporting to us. Oh, I get this random uh, message. Uh, private uh, uh, organ, uh, like for example. Uh, came to uh, my message. This is a very random and stuff like that. So a lot of people are also doing sextortion. They're suddenly calling you and then just like, you know, uh, showing you a very graphic picture. So it's not on Zoom, only on Zoom or like on kind of like this online meeting stuff, but basically on any kind of app, either WhatsApp, Line, stuff like that. We are receiving more and more digital violence than it was before.
there. That's right. So there's so many intersections and layers to how um, the COVID-19 pandemic is actually being uh, weaponized either intentionally or unintentionally against uh, vulnerable women in domestic violence situations. Uh, now I hear that we've got uh, one at least one question waiting on the line. Let's bring in that question as we move towards wrapping up the discussion. So this is a question from um, Akmal Zulkifli. I'll just read it out for everyone as well. A line of thought um, regarding PSAs by the KPWKM, which is Malaysia's Ministry of Women, Family, Community Development. Uh, Akmal says, agreeing on the fact that it is extremely demeaning and sexist, plus totally missing their marks, can and what would be the best way to breach this rural-urban divide in sentiment? Right. So perhaps um, Sharina or Shazana, do you have any perspectives? Is this about a rural urban divide in sentiment when it comes to the so-called Doraemon messaging of KPWKM? Or is it just the sort of messaging that should 100 percent just it's non-negotiable? It should not be there. It's not about whether you're trying to address lowest common denominator. That's right. I, I, I don't think it's a rural urban issue. And if it is, then... Um... Well, it's an issue to, to definitely look into further. But from just looking at the response through social media, I think it encompassed all races and it also encompassed, you know, a wide range in terms of age as well. Um, obviously, I don't know which part of the country they they reside in, but it was both Malay and English and, and other languages as well. So it seemed to be uh, quite a you know general uh, section of the public that responded very seriously, criticizing uh, what was said. I, I, if I can just bring up the one issue about okay. that statement that that people uh, keep uh, bringing up and and uh, you know in in talks I've had uh, is part of the question uh, is that that there, that there seems to be uh, some sort of overlap between normal family mm -hmm. arguments you know. Uh, because, uh, you know, in, in the situation that they're in, of course, tensions will rise, you know, um, get angry about the smallest things because you're worried about either your health or your, your you know, income security, etc., etc. Um, you know, the difference between those kind of arguments and domestic violence, you know, so, and, and I think that's a very unhealthy Route to take. It must be properly clarified that domestic violence is very distinct. You know, the motivations behind it to humiliate, to demean, to control and dominate is quite different from other family arguments where, you know, or which, go, which every couple, which every relationship goes through. Um, so that was quite a worrying one where people, you know, if people started questioning, oh, is this domestic violence or is this just me having an argument oh, yeah <laughs> just exactly. very yeah but yeah. there is a need of course for accurate messaging thanks akmal for the um, additional viewpoints as well uh now we have another question we're going to bring that in as well and we'll open it up to the panel uh Miele, M -A asks, what are the alternatives when shelters are full for domestic violence survivors um Filza, perhaps could you answer from a from a Singaporean perspective first, and then we'll open it up to everyone else too. Um, yeah, so the situation in Singapore is still okay. Our crisis shelters are not at capacity yet, but you know, um, applying for shelters and all that sometimes take a long time. Sometimes you have to meet certain mm. requirements and all that. The bureaucracy, the admin stuff, and all that takes quite long. So. Um, what we've been seeing is that there is this thing called mutual aid spreadsheets going around in Singapore where people can put up their needs and what they require and other people can put up their offers and what they can help out with. And there have been some requests on these spreadsheets for a safe space to stay due to abusive housemates or family violence. And people with spare rooms have been reaching out to these individuals. So this is very helpful for people who require like very urgent help and 
um, sometimes the government agencies are a bit too slow or they are they are full. So this is um, this is very helpful because it's a community helping the community. Hmm, that's right. Love that idea. Mutual need spreadsheets. Um, anyone else from the panel would you like to respond to yeah. that? Yeah, so um, I sure think, um, so given, you know, um, I, I do wanted to add to that. Okay, uh, could we let Shazana go first and then I'll get back to you and India. Thank you. Yeah, just, just, just very quickly, uh, I just wanted no, to no say problem. that, okay, just wanted to say that I, I think a way forward is to look into setting up temporary shelters in hotels and motels, you know. Um, have and having this accessible for survivors uh, currently. And I think this is something that WA is working uh, to do together with the Selangor government to provide more survivors through uh, more access to shelters through temporary uh, shelters at hotels and motels. Yeah. Right. And India, back to you. And India, back to you. You had something to contribute to that point? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not much different. It's not much different from what uh, uh, Singaporean and Malaysian has specifically suggested. Um, currently, right now, if we have we receiving a report from someone who basically need to flee from their house. We were immediately asking them at the beginning, like, do you have any other relative or family that you can go to and stuff like that? Because, like, obviously, because of all of the uh, safe houses are currently closed, so we do not have space to basically come up. Uh, basically um, accommodate them. But right now, uh, Jakarta Feminist uh, Association itself and also Hollywood Jakarta, we are opening a donation for basically community, also community uh, donating us uh, 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 basically uh, for us to provide funds to be able for us to rent like a temporary safe house. So currently we are having, we, we already accommodate around three to four people who are needing a safe house right now. But I do, I do think that this is a problem that it's not only community that needs to work on it, but like, especially the government itself, it is, it is basically their obligation to kind of provide this uh, temporary shelter during this pandemic. So, yeah. All right. And um, just going through, are there any other um, thoughts about what are the alternatives when shelters are full for DV survivors? Yeah. Sharina, um, from your perspective? Sure. Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, hotels and all have been used in other countries um, and it's proven, well, we'll have to see whether it works out well in, in those countries as well. I think France provides hotels and uh, you mentioned just now. Um, but I think one area that we need to look at is also resources um because we also have situations where they are under severe pressure they are uh, undergoing some level of violence but they are not as yet uh ready to leave or willing to leave um and so in that case the you know uh, uh psychological uh, mental uh um assistance you know uh, sorry you know uh, uh, access to counseling and those kind of services must also be made available. Um, and I think uh, resources are becoming an issue um, because I think resources in terms of social services also is limited. And on top of that, with all this uh, social distancing and uh, extra measures that you have to take because of the virus, um, you know, is bearing, it putting a lot of pressure on shelters, on on um, you know the police, on the healthcare system, which might not then prioritize women who are facing violence. Um, you know, so so many um, issues that really need uh, a lot of attention. Um, you know, going forward, and I think the other area is that, you know, what do we do when we come out of this MCO? Because I think we are predicting you know, um, a, a, a severe increase, uh, you know, a very high rate of increase in terms of um, both women fleeing from their homes as well as an upsurge in uh, divorce and, you know, other sort of marital claims that will be made. So Absolutely. That's right. Yes, Shazana, very quickly. 
Yeah, so just just very quickly, I think um, even during now as well as even after the MCO, I think what is really important is for everyone, is what we keep, uh, WO keeps uh, stressing on uh, as safe communities, building safe communities so that um, community um, uh, bystanders, everyone is involved in the effort to end violence. So simple things like calling... Uh, Talian Kase, a neighbor calling Talian Kase when uh, he, she, he or she recognizes violence is going on. You know, um, uh, community effort to end violence. I think that's the way forward, really. Right. Community effort to end violence. Um, and we've got one more last question that we're going to take and then we're actually going to wrap this all up. Thank you so much and so far for all the, the varying viewpoints, um, the suggestions. Um, let's bring it in. So, uh, Rishas Lina Idris asks, can you share what are some of the ground reach out work that your organizations are doing? How is messaging reaching the public? Are there efforts to provide messaging in multiple vernacular languages and also beyond using social media? Uh, Filza, could I begin with you? Um, yeah, like what Shazana said about bystander intervention and all that. So what AWARE is doing, we have a first responder training where we train participants to be empathetic and sensitive when a survivor discloses to them that they've been sexually assaulted, for example, because this specific training is focused on sexual assault. So we train them how to tell survivors to say, you know, it's not your fault, it's your choice, how you want to move forward, it's your experience, and that we are all here to support you as much as we are able to. And right now with this um, lockdown measures in place, we are also developing like a new public training, not just focused on sexual assault, but violence in general to teach participants to provide empathetic support to friends and families because, you know, our helpline, we are also at maximum capacity. We are receiving more calls and we can answer so we are hoping the public can step in to fill in some gaps in emotional support and so yeah we are currently developing this as well right and india would you like to yeah, respond um, to that, yeah sure i think in terms of language itself in indonesia we don't i mean like we have our uh, ethnic language but we have like this up a lot of people here, um, generally we speak Bahasa Indonesia, so it's not very hard for us to best reach out to in terms of language. But in terms of people who live in an urban area, we are, I totally agree with what Singapore has been doing. Like Holabek Jakarta itself, on a daily basis, even before the pandemic, we have our main signature um, project is basically to do a bystander intervention training where we when where we train a uh, society to basically feeling that they have responsibility to actually do something when they see harassment or violence happening in public space. But since the public space right now is very much the decision of public space right now during pandemic is already uh, like it's shifted. So we kind of like encourage people to at least check out on people that checking on people who they think are most vulnerable in terms of pandemic. So this is like basically uh, how we basically trying to uh, encourage society uh, and community itself to basically do something to end harassment. Um, so uh, beyond social, yeah, so like that's exactly what we're doing uh, right now. So like in, with Holabek Chakara itself, we receive a lot of reports in terms of domestic violence or violence that are uh, digital violence that people who are actually reporting are not the one who are experiencing that. So it's basically by sender who thinks that, oh, this is wrong and this is this is my goal to basically to be able to step up and, and uh, harassment. So they are the one who's reporting the incident uh, as by sender itself. So we are the one who's basically kind of like look into it. So what, what, what actually going on and stuff. So in some ways, the bystander intervention method that we basically have built for the past few years, it kind of works quite well during the pandemic. So, yeah. Yeah. So once again, a focus on community efforts. Uh, Shazana? Yeah, so um, just to mm. highlight that, mm. I think uh, uh, similar to what Filza and Anindya also said, I think it's, a, mm. it's uh, really about building uh, local advocates. Uh, local community advocates using local grassroots networks, you know, uh, and, and by empowering uh, such communities to respond to uh, violence, having, uh, getting them to know what exactly is violence and to differentiate first what is violence and when you need to intervene and uh, how do you intervene and where are the uh, sources of help? Where can they refer survivors to? These are critical uh, points of information that 
uh, W is currently working to um, uh, with the communities in uh, Selangor as well as in other states. Mm, that's right. And uh, Sharina, from um, Sister's perspective, um, anything yeah. more that you would also like to be working on? Well, we have a, a, a group of stakeholders from, from single um, uh, mothers association, single women association um, that we interact with regularly. But social media is still one of the major platforms, mm -hmm. you know, also because you're, you're not allowed to move around. So that, that is becoming, exactly. you know, a big yeah. issue in terms of how to reach out. Um, and I just wanted to bring that up because I think uh, all of us are, uh, you know, in uncertain times. And even the NGO community, the manner in which we reach out, the manner in which we can be effective is being severely challenged. Um, you know, the messaging that can go forward. Fortunately, Malaysia is a country where the, you know, access to internet is very high. But at the same time, I think uh, in cases of violence, for example, these women might, might not even have access to their phone. Uh, so, yeah, so this is a real challenge, something that we need to think about for the long term because, you know, uh, these kind of lockdowns, this might not be the only time that we face it. That's right. So there's always, of course, pockets and mm. intersections of those uh, women in particular who cannot access um, all mm. the standard um, accessibility that there is made through social media. Internet definitely comes into focus as a human right, not even yeah. just uh, women's rights. All right. Mm -hmm. So on that note, thank you all so much. We've come to the end of this panel discussion. Uh, we've got thank another you. comment from uh, a couple of panelists just saying that, um, you know, uh, this, there was a conversation about uh, one more thing, the potential rural-urban sentiment gap or divide when it comes to understanding the role of women in the household with a good friend recently. And Akmal says she was thinking the women's ministry is still stuck here, meaning in Malaysia, with old line of thinking regarding role of women. Unfortunate as it is. Uh, apologies, my question was truncated earlier. Was very excited to type the queue. Shout out to my friend Shazana. Woohoo! Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it also starts with um, all of us, uh, uh, women's organizations in particular, like each one of yours, continuing the work to not only address the emergency during COVID 19, but further educating all the way from government, ministries, and even um, the average um, everyday citizen as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll Thank just uh, keep you in the background of, in the broadcast studio. We are, of course, now playing all the visuals that we have for the various helplines represented by each of the organizations that took the time to be a part of our panel today on The Point. We're playing... Um, uh, it from, of course, Women's Aid Organization. This one currently is for AWARE in Singapore, together with, of course, Sisters in Islam, as well as Hollaback and Jakarta Feminists Hotline, which is just as a scroll by on the screen itself. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Not at all. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Talk to you shortly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talk to you shortly. Right. So... The World Health Organization has said unequivocally that one in three women during their lifetime will face physical or sexual violence, mostly via an intimate partner. The epidemic of violence against women, domestic violence in particular, is always an ongoing pandemic. It only gets further exacerbated during an extraordinary global situation like COVID-19. Let's never forget that. And let's also remember, as the remarks made by all the panelists due throughout the duration of the panel, um, community donations, community help, such as temporary shelters, building safe communities, and all of this hinging with government obligations to provide for women and girls in crisis due to violence is something which should become not only essential but necessary as part of everyday life, not just during a pandemic. 
Now, for some, lockdowns are tedious, boring, and restrictive. But for those living under domestic violence, it is a matter of survival. And let's always remember, domestic violence encompasses physical, sexual, psychological, and economic violence against a member of the household, disproportionately a woman receiving it from a man. Thank you so much for joining me here on this episode of The Point. I'm Tamina Kausji. It's been a pleasure having you as part of the show and also as our audience um, sending us in all these really valuable and spot on questions. So until next time, um, stay safe, stay home, stay informed. We'll play for you as well as leave in the comments um, the hotlines once again for all the fantastic women's organizations we spoke to today. Take care. I'll see you again next round.